Is it time to tune in to heavy metal? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Mish Schneider, Director of Trade Education and Research at MarketGage.com. Hi, Mish. It's so good to see you. And great to be back. Thank you, Maggie. Great to see you and everybody behind the scenes as well. Exactly. And we we've got uh, some questions already from the viewers, but let, let's ha- let's just check in since it's been a minute and just get a sense of how are you feeling about the markets right now? What's on your radar? What are you watching? Well, I made a commitment to myself at the beginning of this year to not allow myself to be distracted by what seems so apparent that could happen on the heels of everything that we've experienced in the last couple of years. One was really stick to the idea of a trading range in the indices. And that trading range we can talk about in in a little bit while and when we look at the charts, but essentially looking at a 23 month moving average of around 4,200 in the SPX is the top with the potential if we break 3,900 to a uh, uh, low of maybe 3,200 down the road. So that was the first thing, which meant that I really wasn't going to overly focus in typical stocks, S&P 500 stocks. Second was to keep my focus on commodities and see where the money would continue to flow or not. And as a result, obviously we're seeing a lot of money still flowing into not every commodity, but a lot of commodities. And then, of course, with the Fed, I mean, the whole don't fight the Fed. The problem is, is that the Fed doesn't necessarily really elicit a lot of confidence right now that they even know what to do or what we should do as traders to follow. So almost like discount that in a sense until we don't have until we can't, obviously. Mm. And then finally, really watch uh, the things like the dollar and then, of course, a million of other things going on in the world like geopolitics and. Mother Nature and disasters and all these other things that have been very much in the headlines as we started 2023. So it's interesting. I mean, it it makes sense. Try to cut out the noise uh, or at least focus on what you can wrap your head around because everyone's been commenting what a difficult market it is, how many cross currents there are, and just really hard to sort of sort out what's going to happen. So how are you feeling about commodities? Because we did see them give back a lot of territory and, and, you know, in some cases uh, it was the worst performing sector. So what do you, how are you feeling now? And and that's a big space, but generally, how are you feeling about commodities? Is there, is there an area that you did see the money coming into that held up well and performed well that you like right here? Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I did an article with Kitco and the Niels Christensen who interviewed me said that in the 10 years he's been doing this, he never once interviewed anybody who ever mentioned sugar futures. And I keep coming back to them because they've not budged. They're up 220, futures have been up 225% since it, it fell in uh, right at COVID time in 2020. And you know has fluctuated a little, but it may be the most constant priced commodity that we've had. And it also, you know, has I've said so many times through the years with you, Maggie, has really proven to be a barometer of inflation. And even if you just go back to the 70s and look what it did then. So that's one thing in terms of the constant. But, you know, I have watched the rotation in and out of grains and in and out of precious metals and in and out of the industrial metals. And the truth of the matter is the CRB may have gone down to a 52 week low. But that, to me, is the nature of commodities, is that they're very volatile and they're very cyclical. But the overall mega trend, in terms of the fundamentals, has changed a little, but really not all that much. And that mega trend is that we are in this structurally higher inflationary period and that commodities are going to outperform. Is that the mega trend? Yes, because raw materials are not something that you can just magically create. The earth creates them. Labor has to retrieve them. They have to be delivered. Um, And there are so many obstacles that can get in the way of those simple three steps. And I don't see any reason why at this point we've gone through that cycle. If anything, I think we've been in more of a period of denial about what actually has happened and what can continue to happen with these very essential raw materials. It's interesting that you say that because I 
was thinking back on the year we just had, and I'm I'm getting ready to catch up with Peter Zion again almost a year after we talked, and there was a lot of talk about food commodities in that conversation with him. And we went through this period, whether it's energy or food, of thinking once the war broke out in Ukraine that this was going to be dire. I mean, there were really dire forecasts. We got through last year, and especially as you started to get into the last quarter and into the beginning of this year, it's kind of like everybody forgot about it. You know, it wasn't as bad as expected, at least initially, but that's a shorter term story. And then there's a long term story. So are we looking at a shortage on the food front that's going to continue to support agricultural prices? How are you feeling about the ag space? Well, Clearly, we always have concerns about food shortages because it's dependent on all these things we just mentioned and including Mother Nature. Um, Clearly, you know, with wheat, for example, if we just take that, there has been the crops have done better than expected because there were more rain than was expected. And that's why the price came down. But there is a whole other concern with food commodities that I've been reading about, and that's actually food security getting things delivered uh, because of anything that could sabotage that ability through the geopolitics. And of course, also China and opening up of China, which is a huge consumer. I mean, that's been a factor as well. And there's all these little chess pieces around that I can see happening here. So even though we fell tremendously from its high, it, it still, to me, would be something I wouldn't keep my, take my eye off. And if we just look at DBA, DBA is back over 20. So it dropped to 19, and now it's back over 20. So what this tells me is that these major dips that you're seeing in any of the commodities right now, unlike what I would say in equities, because I think they can dip even more, are probably the buy opportunities, at least for the next couple of years. And in fact, we had a question from Trillionex about DBA saying it has a nice chart pattern. Mish, do you still like this long trade? I do. We're not in it right now, uh, particularly in uh, any of our models. But but essentially, um, that could change very quickly. What happened was it went to a new high and then it came off. And this is exactly what happens with commodities. People uh, don't know, really understand how to trade futures. And so you get these predictors of, oh, they've peaked. And then they get really surprised by that. I mean, it's amazing how many people argue with me on that topic. So getting back to DBA, this consolidation that we're seeing between 20 and say 21, I think if it breaks out over 21, it could easily go up to 24, given a myriad of reasons that could be disruptive to the whole food space. Mm-hmm. We, uh, you mentioned China, and we did. Everyone's been thinking about this reopening story. It seemed like it was disappointing, uh, but today we had manufacturing activity rose to its highest level in more than a decade in February. Um, as you look at this, how are how? And we saw the industrial metals metals outperform. By the way, today. Um, largely on the back of that, although Tony was also flagging them yesterday. So people have been looking at this space connected to that story. Um, you, you sent over a chart of copper and we have people asking, how do you play Dr. Copper? What do you see happening there? So what, what are you looking at in terms of copper on that and, and that industrial metal space? First of all, last time you and I spoke, we talked about copper Mm -hmm. and looking at the COPX chart, we said once it broke out of 30, it was a breakout. So It hasn't even gone anywhere close to 30. It got up over to about 42 and then came down to about 36. And this is exactly, this is such a great example of what I'm talking about is when you see these incredible parabolic moves like that and they come off. In commodities in current environment with all the fundamentals supporting that they haven't necessarily peaked, You cannot go around telling people that's it, they've peaked. And also the prediction that if copper is falling, that's it, we're going into a deep recession because of the Dr. Copper and the relationship it has to housing. We're seeing these paradigms all shifting. The square peg round hole has been something I've said a lot. So getting back to copper right now, we know that there is shortages of copper. We know that the industrial usages are great. 
And, you know, con considering that First Solar, for example, had reported earnings and skyrocketed today in the face of the indices declining, just tells you, just gives you a hint that we're stretching these raw materials, whether it be China opening, whether it be demand to keep up with solar and EVs, whether it be, you know, because just the, 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 the actual housing industry, as much as people say that it's done and it's over and it's going to crash, there's still a lot of infrastructure and construction going on. The construction may be more on the commercial side or at least on the more manufacturing side. But yeah, that's that. You, you, these, as I keep saying, these dips are great buy opportunities. And I think copper has more to the upside. So Roy asking, what do you think the best way is to play Dr. Copper and why? So how, how, do you th how are you thinking about that? Well, there's so many ways to, to play it, obviously. Um, some people look at FCX and uh, some people like COPX and some people like Copper Futures. Um, and, and, and so I, I have actually found, I, you know, you get on an instrument and once you become familiar with the personality of that instrument, that's probably a good idea to stick with that instrument. Mm -hmm. I, I find once I trade something I've never traded before, there's going to be a learning curve. Even if I'm 100% right, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be right in terms of the trade, because there's a learning curve in terms of that volatility of that particular instrument. In fact, we call it average true range, right? Which is essentially how much the average range per day over a 10-day period any instrument trades that almost is its personality because if so, if COPX trades within 60 cents a day and all of a sudden has incredible volatility, that gives you some information. So I know that particular instrument. I mentioned it over 30, it got up to 42. It dropped down to, I think, about 34, 35. It's currently trading at around 38, 39. That tells me now that if it gets back over 40, it still looks like a powerful signal to the upside. That, I'm so glad that you just explained that, Mish, because I think that um, it's something that comes up really understanding and in, in that sense of familiarity as a, yet another thing to put into your framework. And sometimes spreading yourself all over and jumping around too much, you lose a little bit of that insight. So it's such a great comment, such a, a great reminder for everyone, I think. So you're also looking at steel. Is that right? Well, yes, another industrial metal, um, obviously infrastructure play. I mean, the infrastructure bill that was passed, we're kind of almost quietly seeing a lot of government contracts and a lot of purchasing of these essential raw materials to these manufacturing companies that not only need to purchase the raw materials, but need to get them out to their clients. With the elevated prices, it really hasn't slowed down the buying. And again, we're not necessarily seeing these raw materials being replenished at this point because it takes time. So in terms of steel, I mean, just looking at U.S. Steel X, that also dropped back down into the mid 20s and now took out 30 again today. So what this is all saying is that this is a trend to keep your eye on. I mean, obviously, we always say risk reward is important. You have to understand what your time frame of the trade is and all of that. But I, getting back to our original conversation, Maggie, these are the mega trends. And just because I say mega trend doesn't mean that they go straight up. You have to understand the volatile nature of commodities. And most importantly, is you have to understand that even if the Federal Reserve decides to go a half a percent higher or a quarter percent higher, they get to 6% by the end of the year. This may not necessarily have anything to do with the powers of play that are driving these more material prices higher unless they want to get to a point where they crush economies globally. Well, they can't even do that, but more domestically, there would be obviously some kind of a ripple effect and say, OK, we're just going to have to go into a deep recession. Nobody's really going to be able to do anything until these prices come down. And that's not going to happen. Yeah. So when you're so. Uh... United Steel up 4% today. I, I think you're also looking at Alcoa. That had a big move up today. So how how can you, what do you need to look for? It sounds like you're saying pullbacks will happen in these stocks. How do you know, how can you sense if, this, if the trades are getting too crowded and that everyone now, the hot sector is industrial metals and you're going to have everyone going into it? How, how do you judge something like that? Well, you know, charting, obviously, I mean, this is really where I think the intersection between having a fundamental bias 
some sense of what's going on in the macro picture and then looking at old fashioned charting really makes sense if you want to make money and sustain being a trader in this market for a long, long time. So when I look at a chart like, let's say, AA, you know, I could just see that uh, it had broken out over 50 before. And then with talk of more Fed raises and the dollar having a little bit of a rally after it had been tremendously oversold, you see the sellers coming in. And so that's where I start hunting. I much rather buy low, sell high, and in some instances add to winners. But again, then you have to adjust your risk. So you know, just try to understand simple things. You don't even have to make it complicated. If something looks particularly overbought, if something is so far from a major moving average or a period of consolidation or a trend line breakout, stand aside and be patient. Mm. But there's so much in the commodity space to look at right now. So if you missed aluminum or you missed steel or you missed copper, which you may not have even missed, these things could just get going right now. Look at where there has been a correction, but still sort of fits the narrative of this type of sort of chaotic environment I've been talking about all year. And that would be obviously gold, silver, grains, potentially, you know, those are the kinds of things uh, where I'm paying attention and uh, and see if I have a good risk reward like silver and silver hat. Silver is the classic like gold when it looks like dog do is usually when it's the best buy these days. I mean, that's that's been the case. So I actually tweeted out yesterday. Oh, silver looks like dog do. It's probably bottoming. And sure enough, that, too, was up today. So that's how you have to have, have a list of commodities that you like to trade and instruments that you like to trade for those commodities, or if you're a futures trader, that's perfectly okay. And then, you know, evaluate those charts Mm -hmm. and decide what kind of trade. If you're just day trading, yeah, it's okay to pay up a little bit if you're going to get a, a FOMO situation out of it. If you're more swing trading, well, you probably had a really good opportunity over the last week, and I've been trying to help by writing my daily to point out these opportunities. And there are other people like Tony also trying to point out these opportunities. And if you've just missed the boat, you've missed the boat. And now you have to wait for some correction, which eventually will happen. Yeah. Do you, when you're looking at aluminum, is Alcoa the best way you like to express that right now? We have a question from G Blackburn on that. Uh, well, actually, I wrote about Century Aluminum this week, C-E-N-X. I don't know if I sent you that chart. I don't think so, but that's okay. Why, why do you like that? Well, again, it, 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 all right. So first of all, it's a commodity. It's an industrial metal. Um, and, and, and I just love to say it the way the British say it, aluminium. Um, so there's that, the fun factor. But also looking at the chart, um, it came up on one of our scanners. We have a, a product called Complete Trader, which is really, for a discretionary trader, gives you all different types of scans from bullish and bearish reversals to compression and bullish compression uh, or bearish compression. And then it tells you basically whether it's an inside day, how many days over the moving average, what the phase is, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been looking at these products that we have in Market Gauge every day. And when I saw that a couple of days ago, it really interested me because it was a bullish compression. And then when you looked at the chart, you could see the trading range. So once it broke out over 1140, I wrote this whole article about how it was probably a good buy because it's in a space that we're interested in. We still think has a lot of upside potential. And sure enough, it went up and I think it traded as high at one point today at 1250 and settled around 1225. So that's where that came from. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's this is a this is a stock pickers market, which to me means that these stock pickers that are going to do very, very well understand why these areas could do well, which sectors could do well, but also really understand how to look at a chart and and see where risk reward is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have to ask you about gold if we're talking about silver. Um, And by the way, we we talked, I can't remember if it was at the end of December, I think it was, or the very beginning of January, and you were sticking by your commodity thesis and you were pointing out all of these things that are that are rallying right now. Um, and gold was one of the things that you liked. And of course, it had that run up from when we spoke, but it has since given given some back. How are you feeling about it now? Well, classic example, exactly what we're talking about, of volatility. 
Don't forget, I was a I was a gold and silver trader on the floor. We loved this type of volatility. You'd go short and long. You may have a core long position, but you'd go short when the selling started coming in. And I have not changed my long term view of gold at all. And in fact, it's still outperforming the SPY number one. And when we were looking at, I think in January, we looked at the 23 month moving average because it represented this two year business cycle. And I love this because it's probably the simplest way to explain the dynamics of the market right now, because a 23 month business cycle is basically why two years. So you've got 2021, which was such a bullish year, 2022, which was such a bearish year, and that's where we're at now, which is why nobody can decide whether or not we're going to have a soft landing, hard landing, no landing, new expression, stagflation, which, of course, I'm still betting on, because we have not been able to clear over that two-year business cycle into a better period for the U.S. economy. Gold, on the other hand, did last year clear the two-year business cycle and retraced almost to the tick of that 23 month moving average at around, if we look at GLD, which I don't think I sent you that chart, but around 168 or let's call it 1800 in the futures. So all it did to me was come right back down to a perfect support level. And now we can see it's bouncing a little bit in the face of all this hawkish talk. So would you be, are you buying at this, at, at this retracement level? We had, we, well, we had gotten out of silver way at the highs. Um, we actually bought silver because we already own gold. Mm. I would like to add to the gold, but you know, sometimes I'm a little bit cautious about where I'm going to add. I thought maybe we could get a little bit lower, but if we consolidate here between this 168 and 172, yeah, I would definitely think that we're going to go back up. If you want to look at the futures price, maybe 1850 would be the point for it to clear. I still think we can see 2000 and more in the gold. And that's because A, it, it, it'll be somewhat of a safety play. B, we know that countries have been buying an extraordinary amount of gold. And it's so heavily manipulated. I mean, really, it's just incredibly manipulated right now that that too is a factor. So, yeah, short answer. Yes, I still like gold. Well, we started the question asking about heavy metals, and I we, we're getting some hilarious comments in here. William uh, from YouTube said heavy metals great, but classic rock gold is better. I'm <laughs> sort of with you there. Uh, I have to say, William, uh, but uh, w there's some disagreement. Um, who who is it said that Rick said Iron Maiden is underappreciated in my opinion. <laughs> so we That's we've got some we've got some debate on 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 the rock v heavy metal. Well, you know, it's so funny because I actually got to see Iron Maiden in Albuquerque, New Mexico, several years ago. And I was blown away because he, the, the, the lead singer, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is classically trained. It was yeah. almost operatic. It was amazing. But anyway. That's All right, you're 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 on Team Rick. I then now I got it. Now I got to go back and reconsider my opinion, as as often happens when I talk to you, Mish. So we have. Oh my gosh, we have so many great questions. I know we're going to run out of time. Don't worry, we're going to get Mish back on an extended Friday. I mean that that we were planning to anyway. She was kind enough to come in for us today, but we 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 never have an a uh, half an hour is never enough. But let me try to get through some of this. I do want to. Uh, play a clip here, though, because in the mix of all this, as we're talking about bonds, I mentioned the China reopening. We had U.S. factory activity. The ISM today showed activity contracted again in February. New orders were up. The in price index was about 50. Not a great scenario for the Fed. We did see that 10-year hit 4% today. Raul recently sat down with Jeff Moore to talk about the outlook for inflation and bonds. Let's listen to a clip of that, and we'll talk on the other side. I need to say this, if you don't like bonds now, just don't like bonds, right? Keep that in the back of your mind, that this is a pretty good entry point, regardless of your sort of view on the Fed, whether they do 25 at the end of the month of March or 50, a surprise 50, the bond market's in great shape that way. And the key question mark for all of us, the only question is what's inflation doing? And and, and the way that I look at inflation, I'll give you a quick hit around this. Uh, is I think we hit peak inflation late last year, okay? And now the question you have, if you want to use a ski analogy for all of us in the north, are we in a green run, a blue run, or a black run, right? <laughs> Love Cold it. Basket. And I would argue right now we're in a green run. We're still trending down, you know, with the Fed's uh, 
core CPI expectation of three and a half percent by Christmas or next year or this this Christmas looks possible, maybe probable, maybe they're a little off. So that puts us on the green run, which is to say the bond yield curve is going to start getting steadier and steadier. That entire interview is available on our website. Just hit the QR code and find out how to become uh, a member and a part of our community. Uh, Mish, uh, it's interesting because he's they're, they're talking about bonds. So many people got burned by that 60-40 last year, though. There's so much sort of nervousness around the issue of bonds and what's going to happen with the yield curve. It's so inverted. How are you thinking about that space? Well, definitely, I, I, I would think that right now, if you're looking just at the long bonds and the TLTs, it breaks down under that 100. That doesn't look too good. And yes, the yield curve keeps inverting. And Jeff Moore's comments were more that he felt that at some point that would stabilize. And that may or may not be true. I, if it is true, I actually would only get more uh, bullish in, in, the, in the commodity space because it would mean that the Fed has basically given up on trying to control inflation in light of trying to prevent a major, major recession. Mm -hmm. and, and I still think they're going to face that choice. And I also think they may at some point come out and say that they're raising the inflation target from 2% to maybe something like 3%, maybe even 4%. So so as far as his comments go, I, I, I actually, I, I know you want to hear about my thoughts on the inverted uh, yield curves and stuff. I told you in the very beginning, I'm trying not to focus so much on that because yeah. it, it it prevents you from making a good decision trading wise. Obviously, I would not be a buyer right now of long bonds or even junk bonds. They look like they were going to recover and they didn't. So this is really saying that right now having high yield debt is not a smart idea. Interest rates could definitely go up higher. If you're going to do anything with buying, I would say more of the fixed a uh, CD type of situation where you can get four and a half, maybe even eventually 5%, because that's just going to be where to put your money maybe for a year or two. But as far as I, I really wanted to, 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 to read this, what I wrote so that I get this right, because I think with all due respect to somebody like Jeff Moore, who is super bright, and I'm certainly no economist, I always want to tell people that, but whether you're trying to predict whether inflation has peaked or not, and he wants to use a a scheme uh, comparable here. I've said it, this was like helicopter skiing to me. So getting dropped, because he's talking about green skiing, blue skiing, black skiing. Now I'm not a skier, but I know about helicopter skiing. So you get dropped off on this wild mountain slope, right? And if, if there's no rocks in your way, no trees in your way, and you don't have to be involved in an avalanche, maybe you'll get down safely. But I think there are so many avalanches that are still out there. So why don't we just look for the signs? Like, you know, by the way, you know, Germany just had an avalanche, its own avalanche, more peak inflation that they didn't expect. So if silver outperforms gold, a potential avalanche. If the dollar cracks, a potential avalanche. If the Fed isn't aggressive enough, a potential avalanche. If the geopolitical situation erupts, which looks very likely, another avalanche. If oil prices rise, and we haven't even talked about oil, they're right now looking like they held support, they can really break out here. If copper, steel, aluminum prices continue to rally, if sugar continues to fly, food hoarding, social disruption, and if a six plus percent inflation rate that we've had doesn't just resolve like people think by Christmas, and Mother Nature also continues to wreak her little head, then all of that theory about the bond market stabilizing and inflation peaking, throw it out the window. So just for signs, that's all. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that that is more than that is more than just a, a litany of signs. I mean, that is a road fraud, uh, certainly. So that that's fantastic. Um, I, I we have a couple of questions about coffee, uh, and um, Paul pointing out, isn't coffee the same setup as sugar? Are you watching coffee? I know you're watching cocoa. Actually, we took our profits in coffee today. Um, mm. So um, this was a you know a discretionary trade we had done. Well, Brazil um, uh, looked like it was might have had a frost, but it didn't. And so coffee prices went skyrocketing over the last week. And they've come off ten dollars since a week ago. So again, this could just be an example of the nature of something like coffee, another commodity that is very volatile. 
Um, but it, coffee is not necessarily, to me, it got right up. If you want to look at a chart, by the way, of coffee futures, the continuous contract or JO, it went right. And I mean right to the 200 day moving average. At JO was around 55. At uh, the, the coffee continuous contract futures was uh, at around 192, 193 and dropped. So I would say that this is a top, another typical situation. If it comes off more and it starts to consolidate, uh, yeah, maybe I would take another shot at it. Um, or if you wanted to just play it more as a breakout over resistance, if it gets back over that 200 day moving average, then it tells you that things that that, you know, there's a commodity that I've seen go up, limit up for days when all of a sudden co coffee becomes unavailable because of something like a frost. And also a typical commodity takes years to regrow and replenish the supply of coffee. Yeah. One more quick question. I, I, we're out of time, but one more quick question I want to squeeze in. It's not a commodity, uh, but Max has been asking about this for a couple of days. Do you think semis are running out of steam here? You're watching the semiconductor space? Yes. Yes. I, we, yes. <laughs> you watch everything, Mish, but I still feel like I should ask you. <laughs> you know, I, this, this is my life. Uh, you know, com the, trading is my life. Equities, commodities, seeing sector rotation, helping people get through all of this, navigate. This is my life. So, yes, I do watch a lot of things because I love it. It's a passion. Um, and so getting back to semiconductor. Let's go to that 23 month moving average, that two year business cycle. We had that great big rally right up to the 23 month. We took it out for a nanosecond and obviously closed February below it. Now here we are in March. So here's how I would look at semiconductors. If there's anything that's going to drop as a, to the pressure of a potential uh, Fed rate hike, it's going to be the chip area. Then you've got, of course, I mean, there's rumblings again of China, Taiwan. That's not going to be a good thing for the chips. So I think that 240 in SMH is pivotal. We got there today. We fell off a little bit. We get through 250. That would be a very good sign. And uh, it's actually one of the strongest uh, sectors. If actually, I did give you a modern family chart in terms of its outperforming, say, regional banks or retail right now. But that's very typical of what happens. People run into that space. AI was like all of a sudden on everybody's lips. And then now you can see if you're looking at the chart, it's going to be the one in the far uh, right bottom corner. You can see that that 50 week moving average there is like a beacon of support. So I would look for that. If that holds, great, gets through 240, 250, great, breaks down under there, then it's telling you not so good. Miss, you're just amazing. We can't. I, I, we never have enough time. We've got questions about Bitcoin. We didn't even get to Coco. We didn't talk about the modern family. But you're going to come back and you're going to do an extended Friday for us so that we can scoop up all these questions that we didn't get to. Yes, and also people can read my daily and find me on Twitter. So you yes, can thank you. And Mish is, is is always super generous with her time. So um, any follow up, um, feel free to do that. Mish, it's always so great having you on. We talked about we talked about metals. We talked about Iron Maiden. You're going to tell me a story about a nun. I mean, you can't make this up, but we don't even have time for that. We'll fill you all in later. Mish and I are going to continue the conversation offline. But thank you all for tuning in. We'll be here same time tomorrow. And as always, uh, hope to see you here. So in the meantime, take care and good luck out there.